All right, y'all. Welcome back. Just getting things loaded up here. Uh, so, um, round two of this. If uh, hopefully you were able to see these videos, and if, if you weren't, then uh, you know you'll be seeing this one for the first time. So I'm recording this one actually uh, outside today because last time as I was recording, uh, my daughter woke up in the middle of it. So she's taking a nap right now. I'm hoping that we can get through the whole thing today. Uh, but we'll just see. We'll just see. So uh, a couple of just um, you know basic things that are going on with the schedule and you know, looking ahead. And actually, we're going to look behind a little bit too. So if you are uh, the L slot, okay, so if you're watching this day on the L in-class day, if you are the L slot that had Mr. Delahousie, uh, Dr. Delahousie as your sub on uh, Wednesday, then you didn't get to see the first video. Rather than getting us all kind of out of track, uh, if you are in that one particular L slot, I can't remember if it was slot 4L or 2L, I'm going to post that lecture that you missed on Canvas, and at some point, you know, for homework, your assignment will be just to watch that and take the notes. Um, I know that that's going to be kind of tough, so you've missed 4.2's uh, notes, um, or is it, you might have missed, uh, yeah, 4.2's notes. You should be able to make it up in a reasonable amount of time, and then I'll give you an extension on the R4.2 quiz. For everybody else, so that's uh, if you're watching this on uh, Friday, that means that you are you know, the L slots that are watching this on Friday, and then the A through K slots, uh, you guys are watching this on Monday. The goal for us is going to be we're going to try to do two uh, rotations worth of notes today. And the reason for that is it'll actually get us back on track in order to finish up for the, the quarter's end. My hope uh, is that, you know, so far I have not uh, contracted any uh, of the, the virus, so my hope is that I should be back in class uh, sooner rather than later. And, um, you know, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do things a little bit normally uh, into the future. As far as the Sashipe prayer goes, uh, we see on the board right here, the quiz will be in class for the L guys on Tuesday and through the A through K guys on Wednesday. Uh, that's a pushback um, from what we originally said. We originally said that it was going to be on Friday uh, for the L guys and Monday for the A through K guys. But because the video didn't work for some people, they didn't know about it. Uh, so we're going to push the, sus the sus sushi pay <laughs> sushi pay prayer uh, back uh, just a little bit. So for the L guys, yours is going to be on Tuesday. And for the A through K guys, you're using on Wednesday. Uh, the prayer will be posted on Canvas so you can study from it. Uh, it should be also in your, in your prayer books. So um, with that said, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll pray the prayer. And then we'll jump into the notes. I know that it's going to be a lot of notes today. Uh, you know, usually we would have a bit more time for questions. And, and I'm sure you guys would have some questions on some of these saints. Uh, if I'm going too fast, you know, let the proctor know. Maybe he could uh, pause the video. Uh, but... Hopefully you'll have enough time to write the notes as we go through. Uh, I just I know that today is going to be it's going to be tough. I know for for the L guys it's Friday, but uh, you know hang in there you can do it. And um, yeah, let's jump into it. So say in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace, for that is enough for me. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. All right, y'all. So again, if you are an L through Z guy, you missed the 4.2 stuff. So that's going to be on, um, you'll see here, Alphonsus, Stanislaus Kaska, Aloysius Gonzaga, and John Birchmans. But one of the things that we said in that uh, last uh, lecture there was this path that is, you know, you're noticing that these guys were all inspired by one another. Alphonsus is inspired by Peter Faber. Uh, Stanislaus Kaska is a friend of Peter Canisius and Francis Borgia. Aloysius Gonzaga uh, has his first communion from St. Charles Borromeo, not a Jesuit, but also um, you'll see here, Don Birchman's decides to become a Jesuit because of Aloysius Gonzaga. And so there's this there's this thread that's connecting all of them. And what we suggested in the last lecture is that a big part of that thread is the prayer we just prayed. 
this idea of surrendering your will to God. And just one thing that I want to clarify or, you know, just almost reinvite you to consider here is that idea of not losing yourself and giving up your will, your freedom, your intellect, your understanding, everything that you have and call your own. It seems, right, like if you asked modern world, hey, modern world, if I give up everything that I have and call my own, my, my entire understanding, my entire memories, everything that makes me me, if you asked the modern world, he said, hey, modern world, would I become more or less of, my, of myself if I did that? Or, you know, to put it another way, would I, to quote Eminem, uh, lose myself, right? And I think the modern world would respond, yes. Like, if you gave up everything that you have, if you gave up your entire will, all of your memories, uh, then you're no longer you. There's, you know, there's this, this uh, it's not great. But there's an exa this example in, uh, if you take a metaphysics class in college as an undergrad student, someone will inevitably bring up, like, if you could download all of your memories into a computer, and your computer then could function just like your brain, and it could, like, uh, you know, use a monitor to display your thoughts in the same way that you visualize them in your, in your mind, are you, is the computer you, or is, like, the human version you, or are you, have you now cloned yourself? And of course, the idea is, is trying to get you to, to, to think of, you know, are you like, are you more than your thoughts? Are you just a body? Are you a, a soul in a body? What constitutes the soul? And again, anyway, it's not a great example. Um, and for Catholics, it's a much easier distinction than for the people that are mind body dualists. And we're, of course, not mind body dualists. But the point that, uh, that I guess what I'm bringing up is, is that I think the modern world sees the answer to that question is yes, you are all those things. And if you surrender them, you are no longer yourself. You are less of yourself. Okay, the clarifying point. For sainthood and holiness, this, this universal call to holiness, it's actually the opposite. In surrendering your will to God, you do not become less of yourself, but more of yourself. You become more liken to what you should be and what you really are than what you are if you were to hold on to those things. And the saints are such a great example of that, that they would not be saints if they held on to their memories and understandings and their will and said, it's mine, mine alone, right? If you've ever watched Lord of the Rings, um, that's what I, one of the things I've been doing during the quarantine is I'm rereading Lord of the Rings. So I, I just finished uh, The Fellowship of the Ring and I'm, I'm starting The Two Towers. Uh, actually, I started it a couple nights ago. The character Gollum, maybe we'll, we'll look up a picture of Gollum here, is a good example of what we mean. So here's your boy Gollum. Oh yeah, scary. Uh, so your boy Gollum used to look like a, a normal human-like creature. He was kind of like a hobbit. Uh, so before his corruption, you know, he kind of looked like this, right? It's slightly normal. But as he kept declaring the ring uh, the, the ring that, of power that everyone's chasing after in Lord of the Rings, as he kept claiming it for himself, says, it's mine, it's mine, my possession, mine, he becomes more and more corrupted and less and less of himself. That's because that internal gaze actually makes you, uh, like Gollum, uh, less than what you could be, right? Or an analogy I use all the time is that when I used to coach cross country, we, we always tell the guys to keep your eyes up. Keep your eyes up because you want to keep your eye on the, the finish line or at least, you know, ahead of you. Partly because if you look on the ground, you might trip and stumble, but mostly because your your core is the first thing to go in distance running. We'll get Gollum off the screen because he's going he's gonna to freak everybody out. Your core is the first thing to go in distance running. And you most people think, you know, it would be your arms, your legs, probably your legs, uh, but it's actually your core. And so when you look down, you're making it harder and more and more difficult to, to breathe and slowly your body becomes corrupted in the sense that it can't process uh, the energy that it needs efficiently and you slow down. But if you keep your eyes up, not only do you kind of like have this mental boost because you can see the finish line getting closer, but you, it's actually easier for you to run even though it's a little bit tougher at first. You have to surrender a little bit to keep your core straight and it's easier to run. When you give yourself over to God, when you turn your will over to God, 
you are running towards your finish line, you know, heaven, sainthood, and you know, being with God in heaven. And in the same way, that sacrifice of, you know, whether it's keeping your course straight or, or sacrificing, you know, your desires and plans for, to God, that first part's tough. That sacrifice is tough. But it allows you then to run easy in the plans that God has for you. And uh, we'll talk more about this today. But in doing so, you actually become more of yourself than less of yourself. And, and we'll see how that plays out because I know I haven't clarified it yet. I guess I'm kind of... I'm leading you on. I'm holding, I'm, I'm holding you on a, a string. There. Okay, so another guy that, that has a, uh, a connection to a previous Jesuit, and we already talked about him a little bit, is St. Peter Claver. Uh, St. Peter Claver, again, born in Spain, okay, so European life, uh, but not as rich of a life, right? He's, he's the son of a farmer, but he's learned it, right? He studies, studies at the University of Barcelona, and he enters at a pretty young age, uh, and he's also going to be a priest. So unlike some of the other saints we looked at yesterday, uh, he makes it all the way to, to his priesthood. In a conversation, you know, in, in the life of, of um, Alfonso Rodriguez, you know, he decides that he wants to be a missionary in the new world, America. And uh, this is not an easy thing. Uh, we'll see today with the North American martyrs, you know, you guys might be like, oh yeah, America. This America the beautiful, yeah, the land of the free. Why, who wouldn't want to go to America? Well, um, the land right now is not a great place for foreigners uh, for a lot of reasons, right? For, for not, not just uh, the fact that the, the traveling of the, the ocean is, is dangerous, right? You don't know if you're going to make it even across. And once you get over there, it's not like there's established towns and cities that are, are ready to go. I mean, a lot of it is the, uh, the frontier. But also the fact of, of what you'll be doing over there a lot of times involves dangerous work. For Peter Claver, though, he, he feels called to something a little bit different. Uh, at the time, and you know through your Western uh, history classes, that a lot of the European colonies are set up uh, and are run through the slave trade. That it's with, it's with you know the trading of slaves that they're able to establish a lot of the, the colonies. And Peter Claver says, no, I want to go and minister to these people. And it's one of those, you know, it's one of those weird moments in, in our history where uh, you know, Peter Claver clearly recognizes that slavery is, is wrong, clearly recognizes that these slaves are, are human people deserving, you know, dignity, respect, as any human person would. But not everyone sees it that way, right? And it's, it's this weird time of, like, this should be so obvious that, uh, but yet it's not. But that's where that sanctity comes in. It's, uh, you know... Uh, a, a priest once explained it to me in college like this. When you look at the cross, you know, if you're not Catholic or not Christian, you look at it like, that's kind of weird. You guys worship a, a, a dead guy on a tree. And the priest said, uh, well, that's what, that's what true love looks like in a fallen world. That in a fallen world, Christ crucified is the image of love. For us, in this fallen world, what is it like? Where's, what does the bright light look like? It looks like Peter Claver just treating humans as humans. It, it seems so simple, but yet it's so, it, it takes that sanctity to break through sometimes the kind of the, the, the blindfold that's been pu pulled over us uh, in our fallen kind of state. So we already talked a little bit about him, you know, two weeks ago when, when it was his feast day, but you know, the big thing here is that he converted 300,000 uh, people and worked uh, for their humane treatment uh, on the plantations. So again, one guy is not gonna overthrow the entire system. But that one little thing sheds a light that can inspire other people. And then together, right, you, you eventually, um, well, eventually, you know how it plays out. Slavery uh, is, a, is, thank goodness, uh, eventually ended. But again, it just takes one person acting simply to inspire other people. So again, St. Peter Claver, it, it is a pretty radical thing at the time, um, but it's a very simple thing. And so it's showing you that to be a saint, you don't have to have performed tons and tons of miracles. Being a saint means treating people the way they ought to be treated in every scenario possible, right? And then you could be a saint. All right, again, if, if I'm moving too fast, uh, you can slow down. Uh, this video will also be online, so you can always go back at home and, and watch it. All right, uh, St. Edmund Campion, one of my favorite uh, saints. We'll talk a little about some of the other ones on the next slide, but St. Edmund Campion is our first English Jesuit saint that we're going to talk about. And uh, if you remember what's going down, your boy Henry VIII uh, is not too happy with the Catholic Church. 
for, for a number of reasons, okay? But, but one of them is the fact that uh, he's hoping to have a male heir, and so far uh, his wife is unable to provide one, and the Catholic Church does not allow for divorce. Um, the problem is that Henry really wants that male heir. And if you, again, if you know your Western Civ, he doesn't have just one wife or two, uh, but many. And some of them end up uh, not just getting divorced, uh, but beheaded uh, because they cannot uh, give him this, this male heir. Uh, of course, the joke is actually on him. It's probably his fault than it, it more than the, the lady's fault. But what he does is he decides, well, if the Catholic Church isn't going to grant me this divorce, and if they're going to get all mad at me for being you know, the king of a, country, a Catholic country, then I'm just going to start my own religion. And so he uh, decides to you know, break away from the Catholic Church, very similar to how Martin Luther did, but uh, rather than um, being almost on religious grounds, it's more on uh, authoritarian grounds. Like he says, I'm going to set myself up as the head of the church. So as the king of England, he's also the head of the church, and this new religion will be called the Church of England. Not the most creative name, but uh, you know he sets himself up in power there. And so he then seizes all of these different Catholic churches for the Church of England. And then he demands that these priests convert to being Church of England priests, Anglican priests. Uh, not everyone is, uh, not everyone's happy about that. One of these people uh, is St. Edmund Campion. Now, we're going a little bit uh, into the future here. So Campion is a very accomplished guy. Uh, he's um, like highly regarded even amongst uh, the queen. And she wants to make him like the top guy uh, at the university, and like you know, Edmund Campion is going to be—he's going to be. The, everyone knows he's such a great writer and speaker, and she wants him to be his his or her main man. But uh, Edmund's got other plans. To do that, he'd have to become Anglican, uh, and he doesn't. He's not going to. So rather than um, giving into the the queen's uh, requests. He becomes a Jesuit, and what he ends up doing is going secretly into England and serving as a Catholic priest, because to be a Catholic priest at the time is illegal. Uh, you will be, uh, well, killed. <laughs> and you'll see that all these guys here, uh, these are the English martyrs, they're all killed for being priests. So he's disguised as a jewel merchant, and he travels from Catholic family to Catholic family within these towns in England, uh, you know, saying mass, hearing confessions, baptizing, doing all of the things. Uh, he eventually writes what's called Campion's Brag, and it, it's you could think of it in terms of like you know he's 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 uh, bragging about himself, but what it really is 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 that it's his um, pamphlet. You know his I don't think we really do pamphlets so much anymore. You can think of it as his, his Twitter post, uh, his tweet uh, describing um, why he thinks it's so important that the the, the Catholics remain uh, independent from the Anglicans and the, the problems with the Anglican church. Again, he's not trying to say, like, uh, in terms of, like, starting a, a civil war or anything like that. But the idea being that, no, the, the true religion is the Catholic faith, that this Anglican religion is, is, not, um, is not apostolic, as it says, or it doesn't have the authority that it claims it does. He's eventually captured, uh, and we know how the story goes uh, from here. He's hanged, drawn, and quartered, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, quartered means to be separated into four pieces. And he's one of the 40 martyrs of the, uh, not all Jesuits, but mostly Jesuits, uh, 40 martyrs of England and Wales at Tyburn, which is these guys. Uh, so they are, uh, and that should say uh, King Henry VIII, not King Henry VII. The martyrs of England and Wales uh, refused to obey the, the, you know, the Church of England rules. They were a lot of them were um, held at the Tower of London, which is not uh, a lot of people get this confused. It is not um, the bridge, the two, the bridge with the big two towers. That is just the Tower Bridge, and then the Tower of London. You know, it's different than Buckingham Palace, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's the and it's the Tower next to the, the Tower Bridge, but the Tower Bridge is just a bridge. If you go to the Tower of London today, uh, they'll give you a great tour. It, it's worth doing. Um, I've been twice now. Uh, and if you ask the, the tour guides, who are themselves pretty awesome, uh, they, they're, uh, oh gosh, what are they, what are they called? Um, yeomen? 
but they're, they're great. They're the guys in the red uniforms, and they're, they're great tour guides. But they'll usually skip over this part of the history. And, but you, you can see that this is true because in some of the prison cells in the Tower of London today, you can see carved into the wall AMDG. You can see Jesuits' names that have carved their names into the wall way back when. And some of the notable names uh, are St. Robert Southall and St. Henry Walpole. And there's a lot of other ones too. And you can go to this spot in England as well called Tyburn. I have a picture of it that if, we were, if I was in class, I'd show it to you. It's kind of sad. Um, the spot where all these men were martyred uh, for the faith is only marked now with a blue circle and a busy traffic circle that says, here, uh, many Jesuits were martyred and killed. Or it doesn't say martyred, it just says uh, killed. England hasn't quite um, fully admitted to some of these uh, atrocities here. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. We, uh, we still remember. So there's a, a convent there that has, um, this is the device, my mouse isn't, yeah, there it is. This is the device that they'd hang them from. And, and at the convent there, they've got a replica of the very um, you know, device that they would have used to hang the, the Jesuits. And they've got a, a shrine to all the martyrs there. And so, you know, it's again, it's worth checking out. But it's also worth remembering that these guys were willing to die for their faith. And that tells you something about that, that eyes up mentality. That... Um, when you, you know, the, the, the quote goes, the saints love the divine meaning of life more than life itself. And that sign of contradiction actually reveals something very, very true, right? Is that, or you can think of it this way. Um, right now, I think there's a lot of people that are afraid of the coronavirus because they don't believe in life after death. For them, the worst thing in the world could be death, right? But for us, we know that, you know, there's a life after death. And therefore, you know, Death is a part of life, uh, and yet death isn't the end. And so the saints love the divine meaning of life, as in life given to us by the Creator, understanding themselves as the created, and therefore desired the good of the Creator over their own good. And in doing so, they can pass from life through death to eternal life, right? Um, so it's pretty cool, right, that these guys are willing to give of their of themselves, one, to preserve the faith for us, but two, also as, as a great witness to this reality that there is uh, more to life than meets the eyes, uh, to quote the Transformers. Okay, so that was going to be it for 4.3, but to kind of catch us back up, we're going to jump right into 4.4. I know it's a lot for today. Again, if I'm going too fast, uh, you can go home and pause the videos, but I just want to make sure that uh, we get this video in in the allotted time for, for class. So, the North American martyrs. We've talked about these guys as well, and I'm going to kind of go a little quick uh, because you're going to hear about them again, and I also just want to tell, tell you about them in person when we go to the chapel of North American martyrs and we'll do a little um, reflection and spiritual exercise kind of there. But the ones we're going to talk about are these eight Jesuit missionaries sent to the Huron tribe. Uh, they were known kind of locally as the, the black robes um, because they wore uh, black robes. Again, a very, very creative name. Uh, and they were actually pretty successful. Uh, the Hurons were very receptive to their preaching and teaching. And one of the things that the Jesuits were very famous for were using the local customs and way of life to explain matters of the faith. So rather than saying, you know, you need to believe this, or else we're going to kill you. Or you need to believe this or else we're going to torture you. Uh, doesn't really work, right? Like if, if uh, you know, again, another coaching example, I've always found that positive motivation works a lot better than negative motivation. So of course, as a coach, I could say, if you don't run uh, this next lap on under 70 seconds, like that's it, you're off the team. Okay, maybe that'll motivate someone every now and again. But true motivation can kind of come from, you know, saying, uh, look, last week you ran this lap in 73 seconds. I bet you you can do it in 70. And then showing them the, the you know, showing your athletes the progress they're making is going to inspire them to go on further past even that first goal that you want. Why? Because it's become part of themselves. They are taking on the, the responsibility. Well, that's kind of what the Jesuits did. And one of the ways they did it was they learned the language. So uh, it's because of the Jesuits that we know a lot of the, the language. 
there's still um, even some documents of, of uh, translations that we don't quite know what language it's in. Uh, but we think it's the, the, the Huron language and things like that. But they were able to communicate well with the Huron Indians. But not everyone liked them. Uh, and not everyone liked you know, just the European invasion into the New World. And so the, the Mohawks were the ones that really did, uh, were the enemies, not just of the Hurons, but of, of uh, the Jesuits as well. So you can see the, the list of guys here, René Goupil, Isaac Jogues, uh, Jean de Lalonde, Anton Donnell, uh, Jean de Brebeuf, Noel Chabonel, Charles Gagné, and Gabriel Lallemand. Uh, you'll know more about these guys if we hopefully can have the 8th grade pilgrimage to San Antonio because these will be your patron saints for your small groups and uh, you'll each be assigned them in a little biography. The ones we're going to look at are St. Isaac Jogues and Jean de Brebeuf. So if you look at that picture of Isaac Jogues, you might notice something missing right about here and right about here. Uh, so he was uh, with the Huron Indians and in around what is now New York. And he was then tortured by the Iroquois for, you know, again, being a Jesuit. Uh, Isaac Jogues was, was a French uh, missionary, a French Jesuit. And in his first captivity, he was, um, I guess you would say, he was captured and tortured. And one of the ways that they tortured him, they, they bit off his fingers. And a big part of that is that when a priest says Mass, he has to use his index and thumb to hold the Eucharist. Well, if he doesn't have his index <laughs> and, and thumb, uh, he can't do that. And so like, it was, it was a cruel way of torturing him uh, in, in, that, in that sense. He escapes goes back to France, recovers, and they're like, okay, Isaac, you did great work over there, really proud of you, um, but you know what? Obviously, you know it's too dangerous to go back. Uh, you're in poor health. There's there's just, you know, you've done your, do your job. You, you, you served your time. And he says, no, I'm going to go back. And he goes back to the New World, goes back to the Huron Indians, and he's again captured and then killed. Well, that is pretty impressive, right? So it's not just that he was martyred, you know, maybe like got ambushed in the middle of the night. He knew when he went back. He knew what was going to happen. And that takes a specific amount of courage, but again, also that idea of that faith that transcends this life, right? That that divine meaning of life is more than life itself. And I think you can only get to this point if you've surrendered your entire will over to God and say, okay, God, if you want me to go back, I will go back. And that's uh, what he felt God calling him to do. And so he went, knowing the danger. And we kind of go back to our previous prayer there, right? The prayer of generosity. You know, to give and not count the cost. Uh, you know, it would have been, he only, only counted to eight at this point anyway. But, uh, you know, he, he, you know he's, he's living out the very uh, mission of the Jesuits here. Okay. Jean de Brebeuf. Uh, he was known as a great teacher. You can see here he's got his nickname. I, I, I guess it's Echon, Echon uh, by the Hurons, uh, which means teacher. And he's the guy that really learned the Huron language, right? And again, like we said, he tried to show the parallels between the Huron religion and Christianity. Now, I'm not as familiar with the Huron religion, but I know that one of the, you know, the things that they talk about all the time is, is the sun. Right? A lot of people worship the sun. But, you know, it's kind of gray today, but you get the point. The monstrance, which holds the Eucharist at adoration, has rays coming out of it like a sun. And we worship the sun of God. And there's a lot of similarities there, right? Like that the host is a circle, that it's bread that gives life. The sun gives life. And so using those um, you know, similarities... Jean de Brebeuf and the Jesuits were able to make a lot of headway and say, look, it's kind of like this. It's not entirely like this, but it's kind of like what you're familiar to. And so he was able to, you know, to get a lot of people uh, baptized and converted to Christianity. Uh, he was eventually captured, and his uh, torture is, is pretty rough. He is... Uh, he was completely silent during his entire torture, and the uh, Indians were, were so Im impressed with his courage and so like moved by the fact that this guy would suffer so greatly uh, and all this torture and not make a sound 
that they afterwards, after his death, they they drank his blood, ripped out his heart, and and ate it to gain his courage. Um, what's kind of interesting about that is that it's it's not unlike a little bit. Well, okay, again, it's not unlike kind of what we think of the Eucharist in the sense that you know it's it's God's uh, body and blood offered up to us, and by taking it right and, and eating of it, we become more Christ-like. Well, again, we're not cannibals because we talked about before uh, the difference between transubstantiation, uh, accidents, what something looks like, substance, what something is. It looks like bread and wine, but it is substantially the body and blood of Christ, uh, you know, truly and really present. So it's not at all the same thing, but you can kind of see how there's this there's this similarity there, right? Uh, and then he, of course, he was canonized in 1930. So pretty pretty wild stuff. Um, tomorrow we're gonna get into some of the modern saints. So I'm just giving you a little preview here. Sometimes people say, like, "Well, Mr. Flores, that's great. Uh, all these saints, uh, they must have done some pretty cool things, you know, way back when. What about now? What about now? Well, we're gonna see tomorrow Miguel Pro, 1891, uh, Rupert Meyer, 1939. I wonder what uh, era he's going through. And then Walter Chiswick, again, the 1940s and the uh, 1960s. So, some modern day saints are on the way, uh, but that's it for today. What are you going to do now, if you still have time, as I, I don't know how much time is left in the class uh, for you guys when you're watching this, there's a worksheet that's going to say, you know, what is your favorite saint that we've learned about so far, why, and then trying to do that same kind of exercise we did before, putting yourself in the shoes of that saint, what does it look like? Would you have the courage, like Jean de Brebeuf, to suffer at the hands of of your torturers and you know pray silently yeah, right here if you were Isaac Jogues and you got your fingers chewed off would you choose to go back and and uh, and serve the, the the people you were serving if you were uh, if you were in England would you hide as a jewel merchant and travel secretly from house to house knowing at any moment you can get captured and killed would you then publicly brag about it uh, casting more uh, likelihood that you will be caught and, and killed now the answer may be yes, the answer may be no, but it's you know it's a good thought experiment to see like you know what were these guys thinking, what were, what moved them so much that they were willing to to give up everything, and that's when we'll just conclude one more time with this prayer. I don't think you get to a point where you're able to be martyred without having internalized this prayer first. This idea that the only things that you really need are God's love and God's grace. Everything else is then to be returned back. And in doing so, you don't become less of yourself, but you become more of yourself. You become a saint. Okay, guys, again, that's it for today. Make sure you do that worksheet in class. If you don't, you know, just, just finish it uh, for homework. And then uh, for homework online, uh, you'll have R4.4 and 4.3 to do, and I'll have changed the due dates on Canvas. All right, guys, I hope to see you sometime again in person soon. And uh, until then, uh, take it easy. Oh, also to my slot 4L, uh, Paul McBeth won the MVP Open. Uh, check it out, Joe Mez Pro on YouTube. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next one.